Mr. Speaker, we and the People's Progressive Party wish to thank the President for his address to the National Assembly. And we've just listened to the Prime Minister. And I, just, I want to say here today that if anything is comatose, it is this government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the a throne speech, speech by the president on policies, speech by any head of state to the National Assembly or to the Parliament must be taken seriously. And in most jurisdictions around the world, there is a particular approach to these speeches. They are given adequate time to be debated, and there is a protocol following that debate. What we find particularly egregious, Mr. Speaker, is the way this speech and the motion to debate the last speech of the President was brought to the National Assembly. It's been hurriedly placed on the agenda, which led to the discussions in your office. It breached the procedure for the debate of a normal motion. And we think that given what the president said in his speech about the nature of the National Assembly, the importance of the National Assembly, and how we must conduct ourselves in a cooperative manner, that this is an insult to what he said in the National Assembly. Most of our speakers came here today prepared to debate certain motions that are on the order paper. We were told this is the opposition day. And then suddenly we have the president's speech to the National Assembly to, to debate. I'm sure that most of the speakers on our side, we will participate in the debate, but they have not prepared themselves in a manner that befits the full-fledged debate on the policies that the President announced. And so, Mr. Speaker, we we heard from the Prime Minister that, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I was not sure which one of the President's speeches to the National Assembly we were debating. Although the motion said, the motion said we are to debate the speech delivered on the 13th of October, 2016, I heard references to all the speeches that were made by the President to this chamber. We have had, the Prime Minister rightfully pointed out that there are six such speeches, and speeches by themselves to the National, Demo, to National Assembly, not a sign of a functioning democracy. It's not the barometer of a functioning democracy. How many times you address the National Assembly does not really matter. The content of what you say in the speech matters. In fact, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I see it as an imposition on the National Assembly that in such a short period, this has become a routine 
What is reserved for sparing occasions? There must be some weight, some gravity behind the address of a head of state to the National Assembly. Not every time you, the, there is a policy issue, the National Assembly has to suspend itself to listen. But Mr. Speaker, we, the Prime Minister, took tremendous latitude in dealing with all sorts of things. Things that are not in this speech that is subject to the motion that we are debating. So I, I may want to visit those issues myself, given that he has raised them. The Prime Minister said that there was a view in the public that we ought not to the, in, in the President's speech to the National Assembly to revisit the past. And he strongly defended that. And we can never put limitations on what the President says in the National Assembly. And we will not have a problem if there is any revisiting of the past to provide proper context for debate of policies. But there is an obligation that in revisiting the past, you have to be truthful and accurately reflect the past. And I, I saw, Mr. Speaker, the, the Minister of Finance presented us with this document here today. And he said, this is not required by law, but given the commitment of the government to transparency, they have decided to present to the National Assembly a report on the public debt. The President said in his speech, Mr. Speaker, that they inherited a mountain of debt a mountain of debt. Now, first of all, I'm happy that this document was prepared and it reflected the debt situation, the stock of debt, and its evolution from 2011 to 2015. And you will see a trend here, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The trend has been to for a reduction in the debt from 2011 to 2015 in the reporting period. But if you go back a little bit further, you will see that a mountain, where the mountain was, where the mountain was, because the stock of debt in 2015 was $1.1 billion dollars, and it was close to $2 billion when the People's Progressive Party took office. And so I'm happy that this document is prepared, vindicates what the PVP is saying. And we are also happy that the Minister of Finance could have found figures from 2011. When we assumed office in 1992, we couldn't find figures in the, in, to prepare a document like this. Could not. And so context is vital. When the president says we inherited a mountain of debt, the context was not appropriate. It was not clear. The prime minister spoke about FATF. And again, he spoke of the past and distorted that past. The Prime Minister refused to say to the National Assembly and to this nation that twice the People's Progressive Party came to the National Assembly with proposals that would have ensured that we are never placed on that list, on the review. And twice, they, in a partisan manner, those who are now in government, then in opposition with the majority here, 
vote, voted, rejected those amendments in a, in a move that was anti-national, that put this country at risk. He left out that. So he, they took the glory for the restoration of the situation. They took the glory and did not say that the contributory cause, the contributory cause, in fact, the, mere, the, the primary cause for us being on that list was the action of those who were in opposition at that time. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that the Prime Minister again mentioned sovereignty. And the question of territorial integrity and sovereignty, I think, is a question where in Guyana, where there are probably a few public differences between the government and the opposition. But we do have views. And in five of those occasions, this is the sixth one when the president addressed the National Assembly, we were hoping to express those views here in this democracy, the new democracy that the prime minister has provided for us. But the government did not, did not present an opportunity for us to share our views on those speeches. So we do have strong views. We have strong views about approaches, not about the sovereignty of the country and about our territorial integrity, about, but about how best we safeguard this country. And we in the People's Progressive Party, we've been in office in 20, for 23 years. And we have ensured in those 23 years that our borders remain safe. That, our, that we in fact, after a long period historically, we've had a maritime boundary settled because of actions that we took. Because of actions that we took. And so, Mr. Speaker, they, again, the Prime Minister spoke about the address that the President made here to the National Assembly on the 50th anniversary. And again, we too have, have views on this matter. I thought it would have been fitting for this National Assembly to debate the President's speech to the National Assembly, and so that we too would have been able to, to share our perspectives on the 50th anniversary, our challenges in the past, and the way forward for the country. But that opportunity was never provided here. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister said again, don't judge us based on our promises. Never mind all we said on the campaign trail, because when we got into government, we found a different situation. And so I'm going to come a bit to that, because I see the act of excusing on the performance, gaining ascendancy from the government. So our economy is underperforming because of an inept set of policies and approaches by the government. So it has to be the money is not flowing through the economy anymore, not the incompetence of the government. We, can't, we don't have money to, do, to pay the public servants more, or to give pensioners more, because the PPP left us this mountain of debt. But they do have money to take a huge salary increase for themselves. They do have, within six weeks, they do have money to waste on the 
park, the Durban Park, over four hundred million dollars. They do have money to on the bond. They do have money, Mr. Speaker, to go on these fancy trips where an ultimate acts of cronyism that they love to talk about, family members, extended family members are now going traveling with, with, with ministers of the government. And, well, let, let me just stay there, stick it there. And they did have money to present, after less than a year in office, the biggest budget in the history of our country, $230 billion. They did have money to do that after less than a year in office. But they don't, but they don't have money because the PPP left them with a mountain of debt. And so we can't fulfill our promises because of the big, bad PPP and what they left us with. We have heard this, Mr. Speaker. The president said they inherited in his speech a parlous economic situation. And this is far from the truth, Mr. Speaker. Very far from the truth. Guyana's economy for the past 10 years has experienced positive growth. In fact, it's the fastest growing economy in the Caribbean if you look over the period and you average it. It's the fastest growing economy in the Caribbean. Secondly, secondly, in terms of debt stock, Mr. Speaker, there are only two, two Caribbean countries that have a lower debt stock to GDP than, the, the, than Guyana. It is Suriname and Trinidad and Tobago. But when we assumed office, it had the worst debt stock in the, his, well, in the Caribbean. So now we're using less than 5% of revenue to service debt, Mr. Speaker. That leaves 95% of the 165 billion we collect in current revenue to spend back in this country. There was a time when almost 100% of our revenue went to service debt. Almost. Mr. Speaker, the investments, opportunities, this country was booming with investments. They're all dying off now. So let's talk about, about the ICT sector. Qualfund came here under the PPP and, and, and hired a ton of people. Teleperformance came under the People's Progressive Party and hired a ton of people, ton of young people. They're expanding now. The ExxonMobil came here under the People's Progressive Party and found oil. Mr. Speaker, the two new gold mines that started the work and now are producing all the growth in, in the economy, they came here under the People's Progressive Party. We had Santa Fe that the president visited and he spoke about mega farm Santa Fe came here under the People's Progressive Party. This government has not attracted a single large scale investment of any work despite tons of trips, promotion trips abroad. The powerless did not inherit a powerless economy, inherited a thriving economy a thriving economy. So my point is that you do have to be truthful in the context, the context. So Mr. Speaker, the quality of life we spoke about. I, I do not want to depart because I think the Prime Minister did a disservice, a disservice to the president when he departed from the speech made to the National Assembly. It was extraneous, his comments, to the motion. Or the, 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 those comments were extraneous to the motion. So Mr. Speaker, may I come back now to speak about the speech that was made to the National Assembly, the policy speech of the president on the 13th of October. 
I believe that this, this, the policy statement of the government, because I don't see it just as the president's speech. This is the policy statement of the government, the executive. It hopelessly lacks vision. It is dominated, it is dominated by a binary, binary thinking and binary philosophy. That is the, 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 the nature of this speech, Mr. Speaker. It has failed to define a viable framework for the pursuant of the objectives that the government set itself, uh, itself. That, those that of ensuring a good life for people and better governance than the People's Progressive Party. It has failed to set a framework to achieve those goals. It lacks specifics, hopelessly lacks specifics. Broad declarative statements. So, it makes it very hard to debate a policy speech that has very little policies. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it has the few attempts at defining broad areas for the future leave more questions than answers. It leads us into a murky path. We do, we do not have clarity because sometimes it's very contradictory. And I will, I will get to to those in a moment. I will explain how. Mr. I spoke already about the excuses for poor performance. Almost half of the speech was, a, was focused on excusing poor performance and blaming the People's Progressive Party. Mr. Speaker, it takes previous policies and unabashedly unabashedly on abashedly presents them as new thinking and claims them as its own it it does this in an quite carl honorable prime minister um, vice president there is nothing wrong with continuity there's nothing wrong with uh, adopting policies that were practiced in the past there's absolutely nothing in it. We will, we will willingly give you the positive legacy. But at least you should attribute that they came where they came from. <laughs> not, not, not present them as new thinking. Not as new thinking. It distorts history and reality in an unbelievable fashion, Mr. Mr. Speaker, with confidence about our history and our reality that that basically just is a revision of all that we sta stand for. It does not tell us about how people are going to get more jobs. It does not tell us in specific terms about how they're going to be more secure in their homes. Doesn't tell us about the 500 workers at Barama who are going to lose their income soon or the 1,972 uh, young Amerindians who have lost their income. It doesn't define a future for the rice industry that will keep it growing and people employed and money flowing through the economy. It doesn't tell us except in blaming the PPP in the sugar industry does not craft a way forward for the sugar, for the sugar industry. And this is supposed to be a policy speech it does not tell us about the, how they're going to address the depressing situation in the forestry sector. Does not. And those are the things that people in the markets, because their sales now have dropped by 50%. The vendors out there, they're anxiously waiting to hear from a policy speech about where this country will be going. How are they going to improve jobs and create more income and wealth for the country and treasury and, and money for the treasury, more taxes? So the, it fails miserably from, from that perspective. So Mr. Speaker, those are the broad characterization, the way I see the budget, the, the speech. I was going to say budget, but we'll have a budget debate soon. <laughs> and, 
And we, these are the broad. But maybe we can talk a little bit more about the specifics. And so the president spent a significant deal of time speaking about the troubles of the past, what he characterized as troubles, the dark days, the dark days. He said, the troubles will be remembered as the darkest hour in our history. He said, it was a time of deception and cynical rejection of 4.9 million pounds of the UK security sector reform action plan. Mr. Speaker, the, I, the president, as I said before, has a right to talk about any period in our history, and he has given his perspective on that period. But there are other views on that period that he defined as the period of the troubles. And maybe we should talk a bit about the other views. So let's, let's get the, a view from someone who is not from the People's Progressive Party, who is, in fact, he was a leading member of one of the parties in government. And, and Mr. Speaker, he wrote in his book, The Morning After, this book here, which I can submit later um, to, to the, for the answer. On page 65, he said the following, and I'm just going to read by Mr. UC Kwayana, the morning after. And here is a, another view of the period, the troubles. And who were the source of the troubles? Who were the contributory cause of the troubles? And we are talking here about the senseless killings of large numbers of Guyanese, it, um, policemen, ordinary people, babies, a whole range of people. This was done under the guise of revolution. And so he said here, Mr. Speaker, on period 65, when Mr. Hoyt went to Buxton publicly on October 10, 2002, the purpose of the visit was to reassure the gunmen and their supporters that not all the well-known African Guyanese of the country were opposed to them. The most prominent of them was selected for the job. He was hailed by his stronghold constituents. In his, long, in his speech, he did three remarkable things. One, he denounced those who were writing long letters against the actions of the gunmen, even though the writers could not find Buxton on the map. Two, he attacked those who he claimed that, who claimed that Buxton had become an encampment for the escaped prisoners and criminal suspects. And three, he expressed the full solidarity of the People's National Congress with the struggle being waged by the fighters. This, Mr. Speaker, if this is not <coughs> An indictment when the, a former president, the leader of a party, goes to Buxton and makes this speech. Then, and he claims the gunmen because it, I can go on and read more. more. He says, Buxton friendship is not harboring the prisoners, but they were there. The police said so. Felix said so. Felix knew that. And uh, Mr. Speaker, there is another view of who was the source of the trouble, which party was the source of the troubles that led to the slaughter of many, many Guyanese. So all I'm saying that there is, was one view we heard on the 13th of October here in this National Assembly, but there are many other views. And, and I would tell you that APNU or PNC, Mr. Speaker, does not come out well 
in the review by many others. In fact, they were a contributory cause for the trouble. And we've heard about a mother of all inquiry because the government has a, a serious proclivity to doing inquiries. So we should do the mother of all inquiries and then, then examine the role of individuals in that period. Mr. Speaker, in this period when he spoke about the demoralization, in much of the, that period, two members who were, who were former chiefs of staff are now with APNU. They were heading the army in much of the period of the trouble. And one was an, uh, our dear friend, he's, falling, he's sleeping, I, I think he finds me boring. But the, our dear friend, our dear friend, our dear, the Honorable Member Winston Felix was also the head of the police. If there was any, if there was any, yes, exactly, exactly. And if there was any doubt about involvement, maybe we should really do that mother of all inquiry. Mr. Speaker, I, I come to the second part of what was said. It was a time of deception and cynical rejection of the 4.9 million pounds. I, I have here with me a speech written, uh, published in the Starbuck News on December 1st, 2009. In, in fact, it is in the Guyana, it was in Guyana Review 2. Uh, this, this speech was by no other than President David Granger, this, uh, this article. And he said here, the administration, the, speaking in 2009, the 1st of December 2009, he said that the, the administration also initiated various consultative measures, speaking about our administration, the People's Progressive Party administration. The administration also initiated various consultative measures, including establishing the steering committee of the National Consultation on Crime, the Border National Security Committee, and the Discipline Forces Committee and Commission to seek solutions to the unfolding national security crisis. The administration then approached the British government for security assistance. President Jagdeo visited London in May 2002 and personally met with the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police to seek support for his counter-crime campaign. The following year, 2003, a UK advisory defense team visited the country and produced a report on ways in which the capability of the police force could be enhanced. The next year, in October 2004, another defense advisory team visited as did a group of instructors to train members of the police force's tactical service unit to become the core of a special weapons and tactics strike force. So British people came here to train them. The next year, an eight-member team of officials from the Scottish Police Service and the English Police Service came to study the functioning of the police force. A, a, a security sector defense advisory team visited and issued another report in, in November 2001. And then on, page, on the following page, he says just two lines. For most of the past seven years, the Guyana government has been receiving British government assistance to reform the security sector and support the improvement of the police force's capability. Here we have the current president saying we took serious measures to address, including seeking external help, to address the crime situation. But what went wrong if we were working with the British all along? What went wrong with this particular project that was canceled? What went wrong? There were, there were two reasons, Mr. Speaker. The first is we believe that the ownership had to do with ownership. The British 
suggested a structure that would have led to grave problems with domestic ownership of this program. And we had a major problem. And I know in this mood now to sell out the whole interests of the country and farm things out, we, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we're replacing Guyanese management at GPL with a team that we're paying one point, I don't know, eight billion dollars, 14 people from abroad to take over that. And for every little thing under the sun we're bringing in, we have just decided, yeah, yeah. we didn't sign the contract for those people. Yeah. And we're replacing Guyanese management there. I remember you will be speaking for 35 minutes and 31 seconds. Yes, Mr. Speaker. You will have to. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, Mr. Speaker, another convention maybe I, say, I, I looked it up too, is that um, in speeches where you respond to the head of state, I saw that in other parliaments there are no limitations on the leader of the opposition. But it's up to your ruling, Mr. Speaker. Anyhow, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are, we are. I, I remember you have exceeded the 30 minutes which you are, but I draw to yes. your attention where so, you are yes. in that regard. Okay, right. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And because we rarely get a chance.